Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be discussing radiculopathies, and I know I have it here listed as for the cervical spine, but this can really apply anywhere, the cervical, thoracic, or lumbar spines. But here we're really going to talk about the mechanisms of radiculopathies. Now, when we talk about radiculopathies, it's important to have a basic understanding of the relevant anatomy here. Okay, So we've got two vertebrae here, right? It doesn't matter which levels. Uh, here we have C5 and C6, but we could equally be talking about parts of the lumbar spine or the thoracic spine. And then, of course, we have a disc between them. That's the intervertebral disc. Now, obviously, this is a very simplified picture. Um, a lot of the bony landmarks are gone, but then remember, out the sides, we have those intervertebral foramina, and the nerve roots are going to exit through those foramina. So when you hear the term radicular, this refers to a nerve root. So radicular pain literally means nerve root pain. And when somebody has this, they're going to describe it as a burning, sharp, lancing pain that follows a specific pattern according to that particular nerve root. So certain areas of the body have sensory components that have high contributions from a particular nerve root. For example, if we consider C6, if you go down the lateral aspect of the arm from the shoulder, the lateral aspect of the brachium, lateral aspect of the forearm down to the thumb, this entire region has sensory components that have a high contribution from C6. And so if somebody has radicular pain, they're gonna feel this sharp, burning, lancing pain all the way down that distribution. Are they going to feel it on the ulnar side of the forearm or ulnar side of the hand? No, because that area does not have a high distribution of sensory components that have any contribution from C6. That's going to be actually more C8. So that goes into the dermatomal patterns, which we'll get into uh, in the next video. Okay. Now, what is this chemical irritation? Well, there might be some damage here to the intervertebral disc. So the intervertebral disc can actually rupture, and we don't mean a humongous rupture, it can just tear a little bit. And there's always a possibility that when it tears, it's going to release inflammatory chemicals. Now remember I said that these nerve roots are very close to the disc in proximity. So if there's some kind of damage to that disc, and it releases inflammatory chemicals, those inflammatory chemicals are in close proximity to the nerve root, particularly the dorsal nerve root. And they can irritate that nerve root and that irritation causes that radicular pain. Now the reason we say the dorsal root, not the ventral, is because the dorsal root is the component that brings in sensory information into the spinal cord. The ventral part sends motor output out to the skeletal muscles. And so if you irritate the dorsal root and also the dorsal root ganglion with these inflammatory chemicals, um, that's going to produce that radicular pain. And because all of the peripheral distributions that have C6 contributions ultimately converge back to the C6 dorsal root, any one of those areas, so for C6, the thumb, the lateral forearm, lateral brachium, all of those areas are going to experience that burning, sharp pain. And this radicular pain is typically worse distally than it is proximally. So right here where the chemical irritation is, it may actually not be as bad there. It's still going to be burning, but most patients would describe it worse out at the thumb or the lateral forearm. Okay, So it's going to be worse distally in this chemical irritation. Now, when someone's describing this to you, what they're really talking about is radicular pain. Now, radicular pain and radiculopathy are two words or phrases that are often interchanged, and they're not really interchangeable. There are differences between them. Radicular pain is this sharp burning pain that's greater distally that we just described. Okay? But that radicular pain is really caused by irritation of the nerve root. Okay? When we get to mechanical compression, this is going to give us the true radiculopathy. So radicular pain is just that, it's pain. When somebody has a radiculopathy, they're going to have neurological symptoms. And what are these neurological symptoms? They're going to be paresthesias that occur in a dermatomal pattern. It's going to be weakness in a myotomal pattern, and then potentially alterations in reflexes. We'll explain those in a few minutes. But those are neurological symptoms. And many times when people have mechanical compression, 
there's actually no radicular pain. It's actually complete numbness. So this is different. The mechanical compression is more the radiculopathy. Chemical irritation is more radicular pain. Okay, so what is this mechanical compression? We have our same setup here. We've got the C5 and C6 vertebrae. Here's our C6 nerve root. But let's suppose something happens where maybe the disc between the, those two vertebrae has some extrusion. Okay, it herniates in some way. This would actually be a posterolateral lateral herniation, and it ends up compressing this nerve root. Okay, what happens when you compress a nerve root? Well, it's kind of the same thing as when you compress a running hose. So if you go outside, if you have a hose, and you turn the water on, you know water comes out of the hose. What happens then if you step on the hose and put some weight on it? Well, either no water comes out or very little comes out. Okay, so if we think about the information flowing through this dorsal root right here, and it potentially could also be the ventral root for the motor part, it's compressing it. And so information is not going out and it's not coming in. So that means a compressive effect is going to have a different manifestation um, than chemical irritation. Chemical irritation is pain. Now with the compression, we're actually physically obstructing electrical information going to and from uh, the spinal cord through that particular nerve root. Okay. So what happens? One, we get paresthesias. Okay. Now these paresthesias include numbness and tingling. Those are the two most common paresthesias, and they occur in a dermatomal pattern. So if you remember, um, I mentioned previously that the C6 distribution for the sensory part really just goes down the lateral brachium, lateral forearm, and then into the thumb, and really the uh, first interdigital space between the, the thumb and the index finger. Okay, So that distribution, if you have this mechanical compression, you would experience those paresthesias, numbness, tingling. That's what we mean by uh, sensory alterations in a dermatomal pattern, or paresthesias in a dermatomal pattern. But we're also going to potentially have a weakness in a myotomal pattern. So you have your myotomes. The C6 myotome specifically is elbow flexion, but it's also wrist extension. Okay, And those are just two areas where you might see weakness. Now remember, the ventral root comes off of the spinal cord and kind of runs with the dorsal root. Okay, uh, But the ventral root is going away. The dorsal root's coming in. Ventral roots going out and it's sending motor output to skeletal muscles and again not every muscle has equal contributions from each nerve root but it turns out that there's a very high contribution from C6 um, that is the C6 ventral root um, in the biceps brachii and the wrist extensors so elbow flexors wrist extensors and so you might have some weakness in those muscles really anything that has a significant contribution of motor output from the c6 ventral root so that would be weakness in a myotonal pattern okay um, another thing that might also happen uh, if you have a chronically compressed nerve root like this, particularly the ventral root, is you may actually have muscle atrophy. Because if that muscle is not receiving motor output, it will atrophy. And then we also potentially have lower motor neuron signs. These include things like hyporeflexia. So deep tendon reflexes that we can do um, would appear hyporeflexic. They're not going to be very strong, or they could be absent. Um, a, the examples in the upper extremity here would be the C5 one, which is the biceps reflex, the C6, uh, which is the brachioradialis reflex, and the C7 is the triceps reflex. Now, if we have compression of the C6 nerve roots, ventral and dorsal, then we would actually see hyporeflexia just in the C6 reflex, which would be the brachioradialis reflex, and we've covered those in previous videos. Okay, so those are going to be lower motor neuron signs. And the neurological symptoms as a whole are really the paresthesias in a dermatomal pattern, the weakness in a myotomal pattern, and then uh, decreased reflexes. So those are all lower motor neuron signs. And then the other thing to remember is by definition to have a true radiculopathy and not just radicular pain, you have to have those neurological symptoms. And that's why I went over those uh, and beat those to death. Now, one important question you can ask is, um, if you have a true radiculopathy and you have neurological symptoms, do you have to have all three of them? Meaning, do you have to have the dermatomal problem, the myotomal problem, and the hyporeflexia? No, you don't have to have all three. In fact, you just have to have one. As long as you have one, you're going to have a neurological symptom, a positive neuroscreen, 
and then you can probably say, maybe with some other tests, a radiculopathy. Okay, so how would you only have the dermatomal pattern of paresthesias? Well, that would only be if the dorsal root was compressed. Just because you have a herniation here doesn't mean both the dorsal and ventral roots are compressed, right? Only one of them might be compressed if it's minor enough. How would you only have myotomal weakness? Well, if the ventral root was compressed and it spared the dorsal root. And if both were compressed, both the dorsal and ventral roots, you'd see Again, the myotomal weakness and the dermatomal paresthesias. And probably in all three of those cases, you'd see uh, changes in reflexes because they involve both sensory and motor components. But the, the reflexes, at least their diminishing, would be more pronounced when both the ventral and the dorsal roots are both compressed simultaneously. Okay? So hopefully this video gives you some good information on the difference between chemical irritation, i.e. radicular pain, and mechanical compression, i.e. radiculopathy. In the next video, we're really going to be exploring these dermatomal patterns, and we'll see how to predict where we might find paresthesias in mechanical compression or radicular pain in chemical irritation. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.